Good Wednesday morning, YouTube. How you guys doing today? So, um, yesterday, Camille Cosby gave a rare interview uh, concerning her husband, Bill Cosby, because Bill Cosby has been uh, granted uh, an appeal by the courts. Camille is not only speaking out about her husband's um, convictions, sexual assault convictions, she's also speaking out very poignantly and very absolutely on point when it comes to racism uh, in America, particularly particularly pertaining to white women accusing black men of rape and other types of sexual assaults when they are innocent and what happens to them, to the black men as a result of these lies being told on them. So let's listen to Camille's interview, which is absolutely on point. Oh my God. Child. And we'll come back to talk. Okay. Go on then. New developments and the sexual assault case against Bill Cosby. And tonight we have a rare interview with his wife, Camille Cosby. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has agreed to hear two arguments in Bill Cosby's appeal to overturn his 2018 conviction. Cosby is currently serving a three to ten year prison sentence for three counts of indecent assault and battery for drugging and sexually assaulting former Temple University employee Andrea Constan back in 2004. The appeals court will consider whether it was appropriate to allow evidence of assaults against other women into a trial involving Andrea Constant. Cosby has all along maintained his innocence. His wife has stood by her husband, and over the course of their 56-year marriage, friends say that she has played a defining role in his career, including in his hit series, The Cosby Show. Camille Cosby has dedicated decades of her life to philanthropy and various issues affecting African Americans, from education to voting rights to the depiction of blacks in media and throughout history. Thank you so much for joining us, Mrs. Cosby. And you are welcome. So first off, what's your reaction to today's ruling by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which gives your husband a chance to appeal his sexual assault conviction? My first reaction is hopefulness, possibilities now. Finally, there is a court, the, the state's highest court, that has said, wait a minute, there are some problems here. They can be considered for an appeal. I'm very, very pleased with it's not 100%, but now I'm looking at something that is possible, possible for vindication. That is the goal. And, and how is your husband doing? How often do you all communicate? And have you gone to visit him? At, we communicate every single day. My husband is doing very well. And in terms of visiting him, no. Uh, I do not want to see my husband in that kind of an environment. and He doesn't want me to see him in that kind of an environment. And how concerned are you about him being behind bars during this coronavirus pandemic? Very concerned. So far, he is uh, viral free. So if he was even outside of prison, I would have the same concerns. But of course, the, the risks are greater uh, in a prison like that. OK, let's go back to 1960. You were just a teen railing against inequality. What do you feel is the major difference in the struggle for equality then versus now? I think there aren't that many differences. It, people have to be awake to really participate in a movement for justice in a way that is tenacious, in a way that they will not allow distractions, in a way that infiltrators are not going to be successful to weaken the movement. And as long as people stay on course, stay focused, and are fearless, all movements will eventually be successful. And what is your message? Perhaps that's it. But to the up and coming activists, the young people who are on the front lines today. And what do you say to those who are marching but not registered to vote? Now, that part I don't like, because I think the young people must read about all of the folks who died during the 60s to enable them to vote, to enable all of us to vote. They cannot think that the vote is unimportant. We need their energy. We need their intelligence within the movements that are comprised of people of different ge generations. Uh, but they have to be focused. You have to stick with the movement and with the goal of the movement and let others with their agendas have their own movements to, to uh, move forward. But not to weaken a strong movement like this current one. I call them revolutionaries because they are determined to deal with this issue of police brutality. And of course, that spills over to criminal justice reform, too, because the, it, the bad cops, not all cops are bad, but the bad ones are 
absolutely horrific and very dangerous, as we know, and they do the dirty work for the prosecutors who are dirty and for the judges who are dirty. So if they're all interconnected. And young people, please vote. That's the only way to get rid of these folks. Shortly after your own son, Ennis, was murdered back in 1997, you wrote a letter to USA Today called America Taught My Son's Killer to Hate Blacks. And you got a bit of pushback for that article at the time. But do you still feel that that's the case today, 23 years later, when you look at the George Floyds or Ahmaud Arbery's of today? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, the, the media at that time hated the fact that I wrote that article because I did highlight the history of racism in America and that this man who came from the Ukraine learned to be a racist in America because certainly there aren't uh, very many black people in the Ukraine. And then to, to repeatedly report that this was a highway robbery, which was never true. There wasn't any robbery involved in this. This man saw a black man on the road dealing with a car that had malfunction. And he shot him, period. And then when, when he was arrested, he wrote on the walls of his cell that this is a... So, that was clearly racist. This man is clearly racist. I saw a clip of a black woman who is one of the protesters in this current movement against p uh, police brutality. And she was about my age. I'm 76. And she said, I was in the 60s movement and we're still dealing with the same issues. And it is horrific that America still has, is dealing with the same, the, the same issues, but it is the foundation of America's history. It dates back to the enslavement of African people, and there have been humongous problems of injustice, of, of stereotypes to make those who are hateful free to, to inflict pain on those who they have per, uh, projected as being subhuman. It is a horrific interconnection of these historical times pertaining to the real history of the United States of America, which is immersed in violence and bigotry and just overall hatefulness. You know, in raising your voice to speak out on behalf of Black Lives Matter, are you concerned at all about the blowback from the Me Too movement and those who have been critical of you and feel that you're on the wrong side of history when it comes to that cause? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't care what they feel. Uh, secondly, you know, I have to, I'm going to reference another person who is a friend of our family. And well, he was, he's dead now, deceased, the writer James Baldwin. And I'm going to just reference one line, which I think will answer your question, and I will expound on that. But ignorance, allied with power, is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. And I'm going to add the word intentional. The Me Too movement and movements like them have intentional ignorance pertaining to the history of particular white women, not all white women, but particular white women who have, from the very beginning, pertaining to the enslavement of African people, accuse black males of sexual assault without any proof whatsoever, no proof anywhere on the face of the earth. And by ig ignoring that history, they have put out a lie in itself, and that is because I'm female, I'm telling the truth. Well, history disproves that as well. And gender has never, ever equated with truth. So they need to clean up their acts. And that all of us as women who have not participated in anything nefarious, we know how women can lie. We know how they can do the same things that men do, that some men do, because there are good men and bad men. There are good women and bad women. You have called your husband's accusers a mob of women and, and say that he was railroaded. What would be the motivation for dozens of women to come forward with similar accusations against your husband, accusing him of sexual assault? And, and also we have to be mindful that they weren't all white. I mean, there were several uh, black women in those who came forward. Yeah, just joining the group. But I cannot go into that because there are legal ramifications. But I can only say that there was never any proof, just a whole lot of allegations. And I don't know if you'll want to respond, but to the critics who have accused you of victim shaming, what do you say? Because quite often in incidents of, of sexual assault or harassment, um, doctors and medical experts will say it's difficult to have proof unless you actually went to the hospital after. I understand that, but still, among so many women 
who have made claims, they have not ever, none of them presented any proof. And I think that says a lot. I want to lastly go back to, you've compared the treatment of your husband to the murder of Emmett Till, obviously the, the black teen who was murdered for allegedly uh, whistling at a white woman, and, and that was later debunked as a false claim by the woman herself. What's the parallel? The parallel is that the same age-old thing about particular white women making accusations against black men that are unproven. Emmett Till's outcome to mutilate his body in the way that it was, was just really so deeply horrendous. There isn't, I mean, there, there, there's a lack of words for that kind of hatefulness. But see, years ago, I interviewed the survivors from the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots in 1921. And that was another case of a white female making a claim, a sexual assault claim against a black male which we all know, if we know about the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots, and gave license to mobs of white people converging on a very independent, economically independent, educationally independent black community named Greenwood in Tulsa. And hundreds of people were killed. Uh, but this, these unproven allegations. It doesn't even fit in with laws in our country. You've got to prove stuff. My husband was under uh, the scrutiny of several federal entities during the time of Nixon's presidency. He was on that infamous Nixon's list. But for four years, he was harassed by the Internal Revenue, by the FBI, and all that. If he had done all those things these women are claiming, certainly it would have come out then. And in this country, it is impossible for any black man, I don't care how much money he has, how popular it is, to get away with raping a white woman. That is just absolutely impossible. So you boil this all down to racism. You feel that if your husband were not a black man, that these accusations would not have been made and he would not be in prison. Oh, I don't know that because some white men have. I mean, like, you know, there are some who have been sent to prison, but not it's not the same situation as the history of particular white women with black men. We've seen them hanging from trees once they make those accusations. We've seen them being incarcerated once those accusations are made, and once again, unproven. Mrs. Cosby, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, too. Bye-bye, Ms. Davis. Wow. Wow. That was a very powerful... Uh, interview in, in in my mind, you know, I really enjoyed it. I think Camille Cosby sounds and looks wonderful to be seventy six years old. Um, she is absolutely standing by her man. She has been married to him for fifty six years, which is amazing, you know. And there is nothing wrong um with being a good wife, you know. And however you want to put it, right, wrong, or indifferent, whatever you feel about Bill Cosby's convictions, I hope that you guys will respect. The fact that Mrs. Cosby uh, is so strong. She is absolutely woke. She is absolutely on point. Um, I, I love uh, what she said about the young people being revolutionaries. And they need to stick with the agenda of, of you know, you know, reforming, you know, injustices in America when it comes to the, in the the police departments, the justice system. Do you see what I'm saying? She's absolutely on point, in my opinion, about People needing to vote. A lot of people say that they don't vote. They don't want to vote. You're not going to get anything out of it. But some, when you're in the United States of America, the only game um, that you're going to be able to compete in, it, you know, it has to do with your vote as well as your money. It only America only respects uh, your vote and money. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything else is just really it's not even considered. You have to demand respect. You have to demand the right uh, for equal justice. And she's absolutely right. It's, it's, you know, more than 50 years since the civil rights movement, and we're still fighting the same fight. And it's because you have to, you cannot, you can only for so long, you know, ask people to treat you uh, with equality. Uh, ever, you know, eventually it's going to have to be a revolution. Okay. And she's proud of these young people because she said they are not backing down. Uh, and I just love all the gems that she dropped. I love all the historical uh, references that she dropped. Uh, I think this uh, interview was amazing.
I really do. And I also, you know, I, I felt really bad when she was explaining what had happened to her son, how he was murdered on the side of the road because he had car trouble. That is very powerful. She even mentioned Emmett Till. I'm like, go, Mama Cosby. Anyway, y'all, um, let me know what you think about this interview in the comment section below. Um, you guys have a nice day. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Peace.